Listener Production. Hey there, Ben Sion Siebert here with your Monday afternoon briefing. You might have seen the video and the memes all over social media this weekend of a man in a suit laying down next to a planter box on a Canberra footpath at night, swearing loudly into his phone. It was Nationals MP and former Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce who says he'd been drinking and was on prescription medication at the time. Many of us can imagine getting sacked if we were caught on video in such a compromising position. But a lot of people find the image of a politician on the piss almost endearing. See, these politicians, they're just like us. Are there different rules for different people on this stuff? Joyce's position as opposition veterans affairs spokesperson might be on the line, but it's still unclear what the consequences for him may be. Regardless, what does this say about how our politics work in Australia? And importantly, what does our reaction say about us? Sean Kelly is a columnist with the Nine Newspapers and former advisor to Prime Ministers Julia Gillard and Kevin Rudd. Sean, thanks for joining us. Barnaby Joyce is far from the first prominent person to be caught on camera doing something embarrassing after drinking. Why should we care? Well, look, it's it's a, a very good question. And this is a question I feel a bit torn on. Should we care about it? In the, in the end, it's it's one person. He is a, he is a, uh, a front bencher in the Nationals, but he's not. He's obviously not Deputy Prime Minister. The Coalition isn't in government. Uh, and in the end, it's, it's one man's personal experience. What I think stands out for me is the comparison. I think there are people who, if they behave like this, we would care about it. I think there are certain ways that we dismiss Barnaby Joyce uh, and that, uh, and I say that, of course, about the situation before we knew about the prescription medication. There's also talk of him facing certain personal circumstances. So, of course, we should be uh, prepared to be sympathetic uh, towards those Mm -hmm. circumstances. But that said, uh, if, if video like this turned up of certain people in public life, out of public life, I think judgments would be made. I think there is a certain way in which we tend to restrain those judgments when it comes to certain people in public life and, uh, and certainly history shows us in terms of Barnaby Joyce. We've heard that the opposition leader and also the Nationals leader are going to talk to Barnaby Joyce about this, but what do you think will be the consequences for him? One of the very interesting things that's happened over the last few days, I think, is that when it, when the video first emerged, uh, I don't think people were hugely uh, outraged. I think there was a little bit of interest. You know, Barnaby's obviously a little bit of a national celebrity. Uh, people will click on that article. They'll, they'll read the story. But I, I didn't get the sense of any overwhelming judgment. Uh, but I, I think that has started to shift over the, the last 48 hours. And I think part of that is because people are beginning to recognise the double standards that apply to whom we forgive for this behaviour and whom we don't. And, you know, in an article I, I wrote for this morning's Sydney Morning Herald and Age, uh, I draw a couple of comparisons, and I'm not the only person to be doing so. One is between other politicians. So if, a, if you say a female politician was seen drunk in the same position that Barnaby was, I tend to think she would be judged differently. And the reason for that is I think often when men are drinking publicly, politicians in particular, we tend to see that as a a kind of clue to their character, sometimes in good ways, sometimes in bad. For Bob Hawke, it was a sense that he was a larrikin. For Kevin Rudd, uh, you know, when it emerged that he'd been to a strip club in New York in 2007, people in Labor were worried that that would damn him and end his run for the prime ministership. But it seemed to make him more popular because I think people looked at it and thought, oh, that, that deepens our appreciation of Kevin Rudd's complexity. He's a bit of a bit of a dorky guy. He's made some mistakes too. And mm. with Barnaby, I think whatever scandals he happens to, to fall into or, uh, or you know, uh, pursue himself, they're always taken as kind of signs of his, his own larrikinism, his own clownish nature in public life. But I think when, when these things happen to other uh, people, women say, we tend instead to slot them into stereotypes. Uh, and the other, the other comparison that I think is really important is to people out of public life. Mm-hmm. But if you think about the way that Indigenous people who are drunk in public are often treated, there are too many 
genuine examples in our national life of Indigenous people being arrested for being publicly drunk, thrown in a cell, and ending up dead within hours. Now imagine, imagine for a second if that was what had happened to Barnaby Joyce. Imagine the national outrage if he had been arrested over the perception that he was publicly drunk. Imagine the national outrage, you know, and rightly so, if he died in a cell a few hours after being arrested for that. We'd be having a very mm. different discussion right now. Mm. Can you think of any one-to-one comparisons of a another politician in a similar circumstance historically in Australia and what happened to them by contrast? You know, I, I can't think of something that is a direct comparison to this. Uh, one of the things that I think is is worth thinking about is the way that we've changed our attitudes to alcohol over the decades. So, you know, as I mentioned Bob Hawke before, I mentioned Kevin Rudd, and then in, I think, 2015, there was a really interesting incident where Tony Abbott sculled a beer publicly, and rather than being treated like a hero the way Hawkey often was, uh, there was a sense that he'd done something wrong or a little bit off-colour in a way. I think that's really interesting because I, I think when these things happen, they always tell us something about both the, the individual and the way they're seen and about the times they existed. I think for Hawke, he was a reflection of his times in, in both good ways and bad. And Abbott, by the time Abbott was doing that, I think it was taken to be a, an expression of a particular type of masculinity, which by then was beginning to seem quite outdated. I think that's a really interesting comparison. It's a, obviously a very different point to the the one I was making previously. I, I tend to think if videos showed up of, of various other politicians in a similar state, uh, we, we would have a fair bit of difficulty forgiving them. But, but that's partly because Barney's has been through so many scandals and quasi-scandals over the years that we kind of tend to shrug them off as a bit of his character. And you can tell that even the way that I'm, mm. I'm calling him Barnaby. You know, I, I probably call, mm. I would, I do make a point of calling politicians by their last name, but here I am slipping in, into calling him by his first name. I think that says something about the way we have come to treat him in public life. Mm. Well, as you mentioned, he's, there's been plenty of scandals about Barnaby Joyce over the many years. How is it that a politician like Barnaby Joyce keeps on coming back and that the consequences always seem temporary? We tend to read politicians in some ways uh, similarly to the way we read people we meet in everyday life. Over time, we develop perceptions of them. We form patterns in our own mind about the ways that they behave and we come to expect certain things from them. And what really jars with us is when they act outside of those patterns. And that's really when we begin to distrust them. So. You know, for, for Kevin Ruddy, for example, there was a real sense that he was a, was a nice guy in, in public life. And the moments that, uh, that jarred uh, were stories, some of them false, about him losing his temper in private. Uh, mm. And I think that is often true for politicians. If they do something that is odd, at odds with their public image, then we start to really question things. The, the thing for Barnaby Joyce is that over time, he's kind of conditioned us to expect almost anything from him. Uh, you know, it is a very minor version of what we're seeing in relation to Donald Trump at the moment. Donald Trump is saying the most outrageous, horrific things on the campaign trail at the moment, things that are filled with hate that are completely beyond the pale. And they're almost being shrugged off because we've come to accept a certain, or come to expect a certain mode of behaviour from Donald Trump, which means that then a lot of people, I think, basically accept it. Now, I think that says some pretty worrying things about our politics. I think there are certain standards that we should probably hold all politicians to. And I, I wonder if something's happened in our politics that we have let those standards fall so that we accept almost anything from politicians these days because we are prepared to be disappointed at all times. A lot of people listening to this might be in the kind of profession where if you were caught drunk and filmed, your job might be on the line. Why doesn't that happen here? Uh, Look, it's a really good question. The 
coalition are doing a pretty good job of trying to turn this fact that Barnaby Joyce was filmed into the story itself, into there being some moral outrage about somebody filmed him rather than assisting him. I mean, it sounds to me like he was lying on his back talking pretty animatedly. I'm, I'm not sure it was very clear that he needed help. But, you know, there is probably a point to be made about a, a wider society and the way we've come to be happier almost as bystanders and observers than as participants and helpers. Now, Mm. that said, one of the reasons Barnaby Joyce gets away with things uh, is this sense, um, you know, this is very complicated, that he's authentic, that these add to some sense of authenticity and that that then enables him to cut through, to reach the public. But it's probably a little bit of an indictment on us, the voters, as well. Why are we prepared to pay more attention to somebody who behaves like this than somebody who keeps their nose clean, is very serious, you know, has an enormous amount of credibility? And I think that says something about the way we've allowed our politics to become a theatrical spectacle and the way that a lot of us are pretty content with that. Sean Kelly, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks so much for having me. Sean Kelly there. And that's all we have time for in this afternoon edition of The Briefing. And if you want to be part of the show and get an inside look on how it's made, search The Briefing Podcast on Instagram and hit follow and join our broadcast channel. Sasha and the team will be back in your feed from 6am tomorrow morning. I'll be back in the afternoon from 3pm. My name's Ben Sion Siebert. Thanks for listening. Listening.